I have gone from, you know, being dangerous to being, well, she's doing interesting work. Well, she is really the person who has put dietary and medicine studies on the map uh, for MS. Now I am the grandmother leading the <laughs> way for uh, doing dietary and medicine studies and lifestyle studies in the study of MS. And welcome to Pursuing Health. I'm Dr. Julie Fouché, family physician and former CrossFit Games athlete. Here, I bring you information and inspiration to help bridge the gap between fitness and medicine and support your journey toward your healthiest self. Thank you so much for joining me. Now let's get started with this week's episode. Well, welcome to the Pursuing Health podcast. I'm so excited to be joined today by Dr. Terry Walls. So, for those of you who haven't heard of Dr. Walls before, she is an IFM certified practitioner and a clinical professor of medicine at the University of Iowa, where she conducts clinical trials in the setting of multiple sclerosis. And in 2018, she was awarded the very prestigious Institute for Functional Medicine Linus Pauling Award for her contributions in research, clinical care, and patient advocacy. You may have heard of her book. She's an author and wrote The Walls Protocol, A Radical New Way to Treat All Chronic Autoimmune Conditions Using Paleo Principles, as well as an accompanying cookbook. So I'm excited. I've been, as I had told you previously, Dr. Walls, I've been following your journey for many years when I was first in medical school and was just very inspired by the approach you took and how you've taken your own health into your health into your own hands and then used that to help advance the field of medicine and impact so many more patients. And I know you're just getting started. So thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really excited for this conversation. Oh, thank you for having me. <laughs> I thought we could start with some of the, you know, some of the basics of really what led you to a career in medicine in the first place and, and why becoming a doctor was your path. You know, actually, I, I started out in art. I have a Bachelor oh. of Fine Arts in painting, and then decided uh, to go down the route of science. So I was going to go be a, a vet, but along the way, I ended up applying to medical school and uh, went into medicine, obviously. Uh, and I, I'm embarrassed to say that I didn't realize that I was going to have to do a residency. So that was a, a big <laughs> shock. Like, what have I gotten myself into? You liked reading, learning about it all, but... Going you know, through residency I, I was, wasn't necessarily a... I, I was so thrilled to be in, in uh, gross anatomy. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I had these beautiful notebooks of all of those drawings uh, of cadavers because, mm -hmm. you know... Uh, the artistic we, background. Uh, we uh, would so be so excited to be in a gross lab and see that gross anatomy. Mm -hmm. Wow, so cool. And such a cool perspective to have mm -hmm. that, you know, creative artistic background as well going into medicine. It's not... It's not always common. Um, so you decided to to go into medicine. You went through medical school and residency and, and were out in practice. And at some point, um, you started to become a patient yourself. So can you talk about what what it was like when you first knew that something was was not quite right with your body and then and well, then how your journey began with MS? You know, it, in so in 2000, I, I developed weakness of my left leg. I see my neurologist who says, you know, Terry, this could be bad or really, really bad. Mm. Uh, and by, I'm like, okay, so what is really, really bad? Uh, and I'm thinking about the 20 years of relentless worsening of electrical face pains that I've had. Mm. Uh, and uh, those uh, had been diagnosed as trigeminal neurology and had been getting relentlessly worse uh, for literally 20 years. Uh, and I did not want to become disabled. So I was actually praying for a fatal diagnosis while I was going through the workup. It took me about three weeks uh, wow. to get the diagnosis. And uh, it was multiple sclerosis. So, you know, I, I sought out the very best uh, MS center that I could find, and I mm -hmm. took the newest drugs. But, you know, I'm, I'm 45. And at 45, that's the age where the transition to the progressive phase of the illness is happening. Uh, and so for me, I was transitioning. Yeah, and, and within three years, I, I've had 
only one relapse, uh, a transient weakness of my right hand. Um, but otherwise, it was this slow, progressive decline. And my physicians uh, told me that uh, I needed walking sticks and then said, no, what you really need is a toy recline wheelchair. Wow. Uh, and and you're, you're, you know, you're 45 and a so practicing doctor. Yeah. I'm 48, at 48. Okay. At, at that point. And, and um, you know, having to explain this to my kids, um, I'm uh, the head of um, ambulatory care at the VA, uh, and I'm explaining to my staff that yes, I'm in a wheelchair, but it's all going to be fine. Um, and uh, if, if I didn't want to resign my leadership role, I had to at least pretend everything's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, over and over again, for the next two weeks, I kept telling everyone everything was going to be fine. I would say it with a, a lot of confidence. And what was really interesting was that after hearing myself say that confidently for two weeks, I actually began to feel pretty confident <laughs> that things were, you know, everything was going to be fine. Mm -hmm. It's amazing what uh, that self-talk can do and that positive mindset can do. It um, is very uh, important for us to be mindful that what we hear ourselves say, we will make come true. Mm -hmm. And so if we um, are talking uh, very negatively about our future and ourselves, we will make that, that come true as well. Mm -hmm. Our words are so powerful. That's so true. So, so you know, obviously this had to have, have been really scary though at the same time, you know, you're trying to navigate this and, and no, also- it, it's, see, it's certainly see. frightening. Um, you know, before being- uh, a physician, uh, you know, I was an athlete. I competed in full contact taekwondo. Um, I ran, I ran marathons, skied marathons, uh, uh, did long distance biking. Uh, and so, uh, and we had done a lot of uh, camping and wilderness travel uh, and sports with our kids. And so now I'm having to reimagine that life. Uh, and every year, it, it, I, I'm pulling back on what what I can do. And uh, what does it mean to be a parent? What does it mean to uh, 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 to your spouse? Uh, that was a lot um, to have to navigate. Um, and of course, in my heart, I am terrified. Mm -hmm. uh, am I going to be able to continue working? At what point uh, will I have to stop working? Uh, I don't want to be a burden to my family. Um, uh, it, it's a, a very disturbing future. On the other hand, you know, I, I've got my 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 young kids. You know, I, I can't just give up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I spent a lot of time thinking about, okay, um, what am I modeling for them for when they have their difficult times in life? Uh, and so I was like, okay, I, I got to get up, do all that I can, uh, uh, go to work, do the best that I can. Uh, uh, that was, uh, but, but I assure you, I, I was certainly struggling with, with depression, with grief, with despair, but, mm -hmm. you know, I couldn't really talk about it. Uh, and I was going to project a lot more confidence uh, for my family uh, and for my work. Mm-hmm. And then at some point you, you know, you're doing everything you can, but at some point you decided, you know, I, there's got to be something more. You were, you know, looking yeah. at the conventional path for MS and what, what opened your eyes or what inspired you to start looking for additional answers? So, you know, so the sequence uh, in all this is I, I'm diagnosed with MS. I uh, do what many of us do. So, you know, I go to uh, PubMed, I'm reading uh, review articles. Uh, and, you know, it's a progressive disease. Uh, people uh, leave the workforce uh, 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 really quite early. Uh, and I'm just getting more and more upset. Uh, and my wife says, Terry, you got to stop reading. It's just getting you upset. Uh, and that's how we, we got into, we'll find the very best MS center. You'll see the best people. Let them take care of you. Um, and then my... Um, Specialists suggested uh, the work of Ashton Embry and Lauren Cordain. Uh, and so I read uh, Lauren Cordain's uh, papers, decided that 
you know, it, it, the sound, the science seems sound. So after having been a vegetarian, low fat, very low fat, and, and I'd been basically following the swank diet, um, I was like, oh, well, okay, I will go back to eating meat. Mm -hmm. So I gave all, Lauren, all of you. Lauren Cordain was, um, he had done all the original research on the paleo diet. So you were. The paleo diet. And, and his, you know, his, fir his first papers were the uh, all theory based. Mm -hmm. There were no clinical trials. He, he advocated for um, uh, taking nightshades out, grain and legumes out. Uh, on uh, It called it um, uh, a, a lower lectin diet. And it was for people with rheumatoid arthritis. Mm -hmm. So I, I read that like, uh, okay, I'll, I'll try that. And, and then I thought, well, I don't know how long it will take to, for my brain and spinal cord to repair itself. And maybe it can't, maybe all I'm doing is slowing the decline, or maybe all I'm doing is stopping the decline. Mm -hmm. So I, I implement this diet uh, in 2002. I'm still walking around at that point. I can't okay. jog anymore. Uh, I'm swimming. And the next year is when my physician says you need a tilt recline wheelchair. Um, and so that's pretty tough. Mm -hmm. Then I decide that what I'm going to do is I'm going to start looking for off-label studies uh, uh, of drugs that have FDA approval. Uh, and, and that's pretty hard to search and, and find much. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the next year, so uh, it's now um, in 2004, I had this big aha, like, you know, maybe I should look for things that I could access. So I start looking for uh, supplement studies. And I decide that because I, I've had only one relapse, Otherwise, I just have this slow, relentless decline. It looks more like progressive MS. Mm -hmm. It looks more like uh, neurodegeneration, as in Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. So I'm reading the mouse models of neurodegeneration. I'm reading uh, the mouse models of uh, progressive MS. And I am looking for uh, common themes. And I decide that mitochondrial dysfunction is present uh, in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and, and though uh, in ALS and Huntington's. And though no one's talking about it for MS, I decided, you know, I, I think it is. I, I bet it is a factor. Mm -hmm. I, and so then my next leap is, well, what are the supplements that have been helpful for uh, mitochondria? And again, that takes takes a while. Um, I, I find uh, creatine, carnitine, coenzyme Q. Uh, and I uh, add those supplements. And yeah, I've got six months into this. I'm I'm no better. I have you know severe fatigue, uh, sort of by 10 in the morning. Um, and I'm like, I'm wasting my money. Mm. I stop them. Mm -hmm. You know, I get disgusted. I stop those supplements. Yeah, and you know, I, I, twenty-four hours later, I, I'm really struggling. The next morning, I, I I really can't get out out of bed and go to work. And then on the third day, Jackie comes in and says, "You know, honey, I think you ought to take your supplements again." Mm -hmm. So I so I take them, and the next morning I can get up. Huh. And, 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 and mind you, I'm still exhausted. I'm still fatigued, yeah. but I'm back to my usual level of fatigue. And I think, wow, that's really interesting. So two weeks later, I do the same thing. Mm -hmm. I stop my supplements. And, you know, on the second day, I, I can't go to work. I, I'm exhausted. And, and I'm real, I, I can't function on the third day. And then at that evening, I take my supplements. And the next morning, I'm back to my usual level uh, of energy. Uh, and so now I'm feeling optimistic. Yeah. Okay. You've got some, you know, some real data. <laughs> you know, this is really interesting. Mm -hmm. And even if it's not making me better, it's clearly doing something for me. Mm -hmm. And that 
it, it's you know I feel a whole lot better with that the the cell sap that I'd been taking, which is you know um, a, a immune modulating compound, and you know, maybe uh, sort of gray. I, I, I bruise easily. I have uh, mouth sores, um, but you know I was thrilled to take it because what function I had was so valuable to me. Mm -hmm. So, and now I'm like, okay, my supplements are doing something for me. And I'm figuring stuff out that my neurologist isn't bringing to my attention, that my primary care doc's not bringing to my attention. And now I'm really excited about reading the basic science. Mm -hmm. and, and, I'll, and I'll tell you, you know, I'm not a basic scientist. I don't have a PhD. I'm not a neurologist. So reading these studies was really hard work mm -hmm. slow going yeah. it's a slow slog but i i'm excited to be reading these studies I, i'm also on the institute um uh, in, on the institution's institutional review board which reviews and oversees uh, research mm -hmm. so now i i tell that group give me all of your brain related stuff mm, there you go. The studies i want to read um, I want to read what they're doing. I want to get more comfortable reading the science. And, you know, I'm, I'm slowly, you know, adding a, a few, a, a new supplement now and then. Uh, and, you know, I, I um, added, and, and I have very minimal expectations. I just want to know that I'm not making myself worse. Mm -hmm. And there is a plausible um, mechanism of action that this supplement might be helping my mitochondria out in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, this is 2005, 2006. Um, I'm continuing to decline. Um, by 2007, I, I, I really cannot sit up. I can't sit in a, in a regular chair. Mm -hmm. um, when we drive up to Wisconsin, which is a six hour drive, mm -hmm. Um, we we fully extend my chair, so we were in a, in a, in a captain's chair, so we're, we're mm -hmm. uh, reclined back. We have elastic steps that that hold me in. We take a portable zero gravity chair because I can't sit upright uh, in a desk chair um, or a table or, or a chair at at a table to eat anymore. So I I'm in a zero gravity chair, so I'm reclining uh, way back. I can't go out to restaurants anymore. I can't go out to a movie theater anymore because I can't sit upright. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would also say that uh, it's clear to me that I'm on track to become bedridden by my illness. I'm being to have some problems with um, brain fog. So I think it's likely... I'll uh, become demented and I'll have to stop working uh, due to the, the brain fog issues. And my trigeminal neurology has been getting more frequent, more severe, much more difficult to turn off. Yeah. And so my, my fear, Julie, is that, you know, when it turns on, and light triggers the this intense mm -hmm. electrical pain uh, down mm -hmm. to my jaw. Uh, sound will do that. A breeze on my face will do that. Speaking will do that. Swallowing will do that. Mm. So now everything. when it turns on, I go in uh, to the pain clinic. I, I get these uh, injections uh, and I go in every day. And I go to the infusion center and get uh, high dose cyanomedrol. Mm. Uh, and it used to be that three days of solumedrol and two trips to the pain clinic would turn it off. Uh, in 2007, it took five days of solumedrol to turn wow. it off. And so I'm thinking like, um, there will come a time when it will not turn off. And then I'll be left with um, the trigeminal neuralgia permanently on. Uh, and you know, at, at that point, uh, Jackie and I had uh, some pretty intense conversations that um, and we changed my durable power of attorney and my living wealth to make clear that if I stop swallowing, 
And, I, and if I stopped talking because it, it was in, you know, in, um, intolerable pain to do so, mm-hmm. that there'd be no IV fluids and there'd be no tube feeding. Yeah. It, and that gave me, you know, a tremendous comfort to know like, okay, it, it would eventually stop. Wow. That's a, that's a, you know, that's a lot really big, just scary things to be talking about and to be making decisions like that. And uh, if you remember, um, gosh, I'm blanking uh, the, the fellow who, who advocated for the ability, the ability to uh, 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 end your own life, uh, the number one uh, cause or, or, or diagnosis that people came to him because they wanted to mm-hmm. end their life was MS-related uh, trigeminal neuralgia that was permanently on. Uh, yeah. Incredible pain. Wow. But, you know, what, what is really interesting is I so I now view that trigeminal neuralgia very, very differently. So for for 27 years, my trigeminal neuralgia, you know, would would turn on horrific levels of pain. Uh, And then in 2007, I began to learn how to, when you want to redesign my diet and lifestyle and, and, you know, rapidly change my health, that my my pain stopped. Mm. And now I... That when if I accidentally you know come to your house and you accidentally gave me gluten dairy or eggs, <laughs> in six to eight hours my my pain would turn on again. Mm. And now I know that my trigeminal nerve is this very sensitive barometer of the level of inflammation in my brain and mm-hmm. how happy my microglia are. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so now. I see this as this amazing tool and feedback that what's going on with my diet and my self-care routine. Mm. If the sensation of my face is changing, uh, then I'll have a conversation with myself and with uh, my family. Like, okay, what do you, how do you think I got contaminated? Yeah. What do you think is going on with my self-care routine? Uh, am I slipping up? Am I doing too many eight o'clock in the morning meetings? Am I mm-hmm. did I uh, 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 fail to do my saunas and my uh, ice baths? Uh, am I slacking off? And that over time has allowed me to create a much more precise uh, diet and self care program for me. Mm-hmm. It's now how I teach my my tribe that they can use their, and I call them biosensors. Mm -hmm. Your symptoms will give you feedback. If you will really dial in and pay attention to what are your symptoms, Mm -hmm. and then really dial in and think about, okay, what does your diet and self-care program look like right now? Could it be improved? That's amazing. And I love just how we talked about before, how you can turn it into a positive, even though it was, you know, the worst pain you could imagine. Now you're seeing it as, wow, this is something that can give me information. Um, and, and to, to coach people that their symptoms give information instead of being this, you know, terrible thing, um, to see it as only a negative. Yeah. You know, I I help my, my patients, my tribe understand that if you have pain, that is actually a very helpful signal because most of us will not ignore pain. Mm-hmm. Um, so pain is, is very helpful. Um, if you have uh, a, a mental health symptom, we tend to minimize our mental health issues. We tend to not have much insight. Um, so that's uh, much more difficult. Mm-hmm. If you have a skin rash, that's visible. So you can you, you get... Uh, something there Um, uh, so having a conversation what are your symptoms what can we leverage what will you pay attention to what is it you're going to ignore and so it's probably not going to be so useful for you Mm -hmm. so tell us you were just getting to the point where 
things were looking pretty grim for you and you're talking about changing your power of attorney and making these end of life decisions. But then at some point you decided or you, you found more information and really made even more changes to your diet and lifestyle. Yeah. So, so, you know, I'm doing, uh, I've done the paleo diet. Um, it may be slowed by decline, but I'm still declining. I add supplements. It they slow my decline, but I'm still declining. Um, then I uh, my my boss pulls me in and tells me he's going to send me to the traumatic brain injury clinic. Describes the job. I'll go to that new clinic in six months. And I know I, I can't possibly do that job. It's mm-hmm. it's physically I, I can't manage that. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm pretty bummed by by that. But two weeks later. In the institutional review packet is a study using electrical stimulation muscles. Mm. Uh, and uh, it's for people with a, a traumatic spinal cord injury. Uh, I read that, I'm intrigued. I go to PubMed, there's only 212 articles. Uh, I, I read all their abstracts, it doesn't take that long. Uh, and I convince my physical therapist to let me try it. Okay. This, um, uh, he, he knows he could grow bigger muscles for me. But he doesn't know if my brain could talk to these muscles. Mm-hmm. And so he might be making it harder uh, to have the, the limited function that I have. But he does let me have a test session. It hurts bad, really bad. But mm-hmm. when it's over, I feel great. And so we begin doing uh, the electrical simulation as part of my physical therapy. Okay. At, at about that same time, I discover the Institute for Functional Medicine. Mm-hmm. And I'm intrigued by that. And I see they have a course on neuroprotection. So I order that course, uh, which is um, uh, audio synchronized PowerPoint slides and a big notebook uh, of cases. Mm-hmm. I, and uh, I, I go through that in the midst of my brain fog. So this is not easy stuff. There's a <laughs> lot of mitochondria. Yeah, a uh, lot of biochemistry. Lot of biochemistry. I, I'm very excited about that. I have a longer list of supplements, and I have them, and I'm and I'm happy to take them. And then, so you know, I'm, I'm doing that over the summer. I uh, and then I have this really big aha, and not actually quite embarrassed about how long it took me to have this aha. <laughs> it's like, what if I redesign my paleo diet based on this list of 17 different supplements that I'm taking? Mm. Uh, and figure out where they are in the food supply. So it takes um, a few months uh, to do the research to get that going. And I start this new way of eating December 26th. And oh, at first it's my birthday. It's a great day. Oh, it's a very auspicious day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then in, in January, I go off to this new clinic that I know I can't possibly do. Uh, but the first two weeks, I'm just watching my partner. So, like, I should be able to do that mm-hmm. for my wheelchair. Not, not a problem. The third week, so, you know, it's my basically my fourth week of this new way of eating. Mm-hmm. I start doing the exams. At the end of the first day, it's like, well, I, that wasn't too bad. Mm-hmm. And then at the end of the first week, I'm like, you know, that wasn't too bad at all. I wow. think I can do this. All right. And then I, I realized, you know, I think my energy is a little bit better. And then, and this is a big deal. You know, I've been I've been eating my meals in the zero gravity chair, leaning back, sort of making my family really nervous. I was going to aspirate on, yeah. on my food all the time. And I decide to sit in a regular chair wow. and, I, and, I, and, I, and I have have a meal with my family in a regular chair it's a big deal and that was okay because before then if i sat in a regular chair for, for more than 10 minutes i would be so exhausted i have to be flat on my back for the rest of the day, for the rest of the day wow so i thought well that was really interesting so i switched my zero gravity chair in my office for a regular chair. And it was okay. <laughs> wow, that was pretty interesting. 
Uh, and then in, in the end of February, I I uh, have my walking sticks uh, in my office, and I decide I'm going to try mailing a letter. And I, I walk using my walking sticks, and uh, people in the hallway are like, "Oh my God, Dr. Walls, you, you're you're walking!" <laughs> and, and mind you. Four years earlier, it was like, oh, my God, Dr. Walls, you're in a total client wheelchair. Yeah. And now it was like, oh, my God, you're walking. What happened? It's a miracle. <laughs> uh, it, and so then I start walking. Uh, and I, I'm walking with walking sticks throughout, throughout the hospital. I, and then um, in... Oh, I think it was the beginning of April. I had my my uh, meeting with the chair of medicine, and I it, have to go down a hill, up a hill. It, it's it's a pretty long walk, and like you know, that's too far to walk. So I'll um, and and by then I've I've got I've taken my tilt recline wheelchair out. I have a little scooter, uh, and I'm going to ride that over. But my scooter dies mm. going over. Uh, and so I disengage it and I push it up the hill <laughs> and I leave it by the um, uh, entrance uh, and they offer to call the patient mobile. I said, uh, how long will that take? Well, I'll have to wait another half hour, but I'm, but I'm already late mm -hmm. um, uh, because, you know, I, I did not plan on having to push my <laughs> wheelchair up the hill. <laughs> So I go, no, I better walk. So I, I walk slowly and I, and I get to my uh, chair's office and ex explain to him that I'd pushed my scooter up the hill and I walked over. Mm -hmm. He's like, you what? <laughs> uh, and, and so I, I explain uh, what, what what had happened. Um, I show him my electrical stimulation device. I uh, talk about the diet uh, changes. Uh, and he he's thrilled. Mm -hmm. And then he says, Terry, I want you to do a case report uh, with your treating medical team. This is just so important. Uh, mm -hmm. And we get that written up. Then he calls me back and says, uh, and now what I want you to do is uh, a safety and feasibility study to see if others with progressive MS can implement what you've done and um, what the effect size is. Uh, and of course, is, is it safe? Uh, and I'm like, I, I don't know how to do clinical trials. And he mm -hmm. says, I'll get you the mentors. Uh, and so in 2000, so then I have to write, write up the protocol. Uh, I said, you'll have to write the protocol of what you've done. Uh, and uh, it, that takes uh, a while to do. It, it takes a while to get through the IRB. Uh, mm -hmm. Then I have to get um, uh, uh, funding uh, to pay for the supplements and uh, the electrical stim devices. But thanks to um, Ashton Embry's nonprofit and mm -hmm. to the uh, company that made the electrical stim devices, we were able to uh, have the funding to pay for the supplements uh, mm -hmm. and the funding to uh, pay for uh, the devices. Uh, and uh, we found a PhD student who would use this for her dissertation. Wow. And we did that first study. That's incredible. Incredible that you had such support too from your chair to really push you to do it and, yeah. and give you the right the right mentors to make it happen. And the chair of um, uh, the chief of staff at the VA uh, gave me the time from clinic, so mm -hmm. I I could um, you know a couple of days a week go run our study visits uh, and make this happen. It's incredible. And what have you, I know your, you know, research is still ongoing, but so far, how have, I know you've done a so lot of research on this. You, how? So the, the first study, we had 20 folks with secondary primary progressive MS. They were between a cane and a walker in terms of that's how disabled they were. Mm -hmm. uh, they had really quite severe fatigue. Um, uh, fatigue score ranges from one, no fatigue, seven total fatigue. Uh, it was 5.38, so really quite severe. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're able to show that, yep, people could uh, radically change their diet. Uh, they could uh, begin the mantra-based meditation. Uh, they could exercise. They could do their e-stem. 
Um, so yes, they would do all of this. The biggest side effect was if you're overweight or obese, you lost weight. Uh, and actually, if you're overweight or obese, you lost a lot of weight very rapidly in the beginning. And then, and then it slowed down. Uh, nobody became underweight. Uh, we had one person who had to withdraw because of continued cognitive decline. And that, that's uh, a common uh, occurrence uh, in progressive MS, uh, continued mm -hmm. cognitive decline. We're able to have uh, remark the fatigue severity score dropped by 2.38 points. Wow. 0.45 is clinically meaningful. So uh, that's a that's huge. A, huge. The uh, quality of life score and short form 36 energy and general health improved by 14 and 17 points. And the clinically significant uh, improvement uh, is five points. So again, a, a huge uh, improvement in quality of life. And um, this uh, anxiety, depression uh, scales on the BEC um, anxiety index, BEC depression index, uh, they both improved. Uh, the um, uh, verbal and nonverbal reasonings uh, uh, both improved. Uh, and we have to think about the fact that you would anticipate worsening cognitive decline over that uh, uh, 12 months. You anticipate a 10 to 20% worsening of their uh, cognitive scores. In terms of walking, uh, again, you want to think that 10 to 20% worsening every year, mm -hmm. but half of these folks had clinically meaningful improvement. So as a group, the um, uh, the uh, uh, walking uh, uh, was stable. Okay. Uh, and That's hand cool. function was stable as a group. Amazing. That's amazing. So, you know, you're you know you've seen this work in yourself. You've seen this work in now study participants. Study participants. So, so that one was not randomized. Everyone got the uh, intervention. Then we've mm -hmm. done two small pilot. Um, uh, randomized trials. Again, we show that people can implement. Uh, at that time, we did just the diet, mm -hmm. uh, and we did it with relapse remitting MS. They could implement uh, the interventions. Uh, fatigue went down. Quality of life uh, improved. Uh, motor function uh, improved. Uh, and then we did a larger study. That's a parallel group study comparing the low-fat uh, swank diet uh, in the uh, Wall's elimination diet, modified paleo uh, with an elimination phase that takes out gluten, uh, grain, legumes, and nightshades for 12 weeks. Then you can reintroduce the ingredients one uh, at a time. Uh, you continue to be uh, gluten-free uh, and dairy-free. Mm -hmm. We, <clears throat> excuse me, had a 12-week observation period. People came in, had baseline assessments ate the usual diet, came back at 12 weeks, repeated all their assessments. Then they get randomized uh, to the Swank uh, or the Walls diet. Mm -hmm. Came back at 12 weeks for repeat assessments. And then again at 24 weeks for repeat assessments. We're able to show that for both um, the Swank group and the Walls group, fatigue was reduced. For the modified fatigue impact scale, the Walls group was significantly more reduced than the swank group, but it was helpful uh, in the swank group as well. Mm -hmm. Quality of life improved uh, in, for both groups, but again, quality of life improved more for the Walls group than the swank group. The walking endurance, if I could walk for um, six minutes, mm -hmm. neither group changed at 12 weeks, but at 24 weeks, uh, the Walls group uh, had uh, clinically significantly more walking endurance that, that uh, okay. was clinically significant. Although the p-value between the walls and swank group was 0.08, so it's a trend, it's not, not quite statistically okay. different. Sure. The um, working memory, uh, simple digit modalities test, that interestingly enough was better for the swank group at 12, 12 weeks, but was uh, equivalent for walls and swank at 24 weeks. Wow. Wow. So 
you oh, know, yeah, continuing. The, oh, the, the common theme, um, we, we ask the people doing the swank diet to have at least four servings of uh, vegetables a day. And we ask the folks doing the walls diet to have six to nine servings of vegetables a day. So I, I think the common theme for both is we ask both groups to reduce the added sugar, reduce the processed foods, and mm -hmm. eat more vegetables. Mm -hmm. Kind of common common variables that I think almost anybody would agree with are going to be healthy, a part of a healthy diet. Um, so I'm I'm curious about what the response to this has been like because now not only are you sharing your story, you've got you know, research, you know, increasingly more vigorous well, research studies to back up um, what you're doing. But I know it hasn't been easy for you. And initially, this was this was met with a lot of skepticism. So how is that? How has that been? Well, are you no, talking to your colleagues or talking to others who are, you know, specializing in MS care? So in 2009, I, I was um, severely criticized, roundly condemned, uh, uh, my message was considered dangerous. Um, we, and it was controversial even here at the university. Mm -hmm. uh, I was banned as a speaker by the MS Society. Um, but, you know, I kept, fortunately, my chair of medicine had become the dean of the, medicine, of the College of Medicine. He wanted me to do this study, so we got the study going. And we kept presenting our, our, our data at the research week uh, for the College of Medicine. Mm -hmm. And we had these amazing videos of uh, the improvement uh, in walking that was mm -hmm. being achieved. Uh, and we had a very hard time getting our first paper published because it was a complicated multimodal intervention, but we finally did. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you know, we've since published uh, uh, four papers out of that first study. Uh, and, and and then we got our uh, next two pilot studies. We got those published. Um, then we uh, are we published more uh, theory uh, pieces. Uh, and then we got the Swank study uh, published, uh, known as the Waves uh, trial, Walls versus Swank. And now we are finally into much higher impact journals, uh, and we are presenting this data at the um, uh, uh, leading MS uh, research scientific meetings. And our work uh, is now being cited. We've been cited by, uh, I believe, 155 uh, different uh, um, uh, uh, journals now, the, the original okay. study. So I have gone from you know being dangerous to being, well, she's doing interesting work. Well, she is really the person who has put dietary intervention studies on the map uh, for MS. Now I am the grandmother leading the <laughs> way for uh, doing dietary intervention studies and lifestyle studies in the setting of MS. Uh, and now I, I'm, I'm on the uh, part of the uh, nutrition uh, uh, committee uh, on the uh, MS Society. And our- Which I wonder uh, if there even was a nutrition committee yeah, you know, was. 15 years ago. And, and I'll tell you, uh, th there wasn't. The MS Society created the uh, Wellness Conference in 2014. When my book came out, uh, The Wellness Protocol, first came out in 2014, <clears throat> it, it created an uproar because mm -hmm. it was a bestseller. Uh, and so their constituents were, and they follow what their constituents are saying in social media. And so there's all this conversation about these new biologic drugs. And then when my book came out, all of that conversation was immediately dwarfed by the Walls Protocol, the Walls Diet, Dr. Terry Walls. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, that summer, they, they decided they needed to have the wellness uh, um, retreat uh, their, because their donors were demanding it. Mm -hmm. And their donors wanted to see to it that I'd be at that conference. So then they had to track me down, uh, asked me would I attend. I said, well, um, I'm a plenary speaker at another conference in New York that day. So I'll, I'll call and see if I, if I can make some adjustments. But you need to unban me. I can't come to your conference as a banned speaker. 
<laughs> so then they were very apologetic. They said, yes, of course, they would un unban me. I, and they realized that my message about that you should eat vegetables, work with a physical therapist, meditate, work with your primary care doc to improve your diet was actually a pretty good message. It's a pretty good message. So true. And it's it's so interesting to me um, just ha that that whole cycle of how, you know, these new concepts are often resisted and to say they're new, I mean, diet and nutrition is not a new concept, but I, re I remember even being a medical student and hearing your story and doing my neurology rotations or rotating in an MS clinic and bringing it up. And oftentimes you get very um, negative reactions. I mean, very this negative. was 10 years ago, but because it was just unfamiliar. And I think there's this fear maybe that doctors have that their patients mm -hmm. are going to stop taking their medications and just go onto the diet and then potentially get worse. And so, mm -hmm. um, I'm just so grateful that you have pursued this and have not gotten scared away by some of the initial skepticism and continue to move forward with your research because ultimately the data speaks for itself. The data is the data. You know, I, I um, I, I tell uh, all of my tribe, uh, uh, all of my students, my postdocs, is if you have a new idea, you will meet enormous resistance. Uh, your paper will have a huge difficulty finding uh, a journal that will uh, accept it. You'll have to go to a very, very low impact journal. Uh, and then gradually, you'll be able to go to a higher impact journal, higher impact journal. Uh, and eventually, they'll all say like, of course. But uh, what we're talking about makes sense. But in the beginning, no one will believe you. So you have to have a, a thick hide uh, mm -hmm. and just do your work uh, and see if it's validated in study after study. And eventually it will it will come to pass. But always, if you're an innovator, if you have a new idea, nobody will believe you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I'd be interviewed. Uh, people would would condemn me. I mean, they they were you know some really pretty rude things. And I'm like, well, you guys need to do what you think is professionally the right thing to do. Uh, and I am very careful to say this is my story. This is the mechanisms. These are the research, the studies that we are doing. Mm -hmm. And then I want you to work with your primary care doc to improve your diet. I want you to ask for a referral for some sort of stress reducing practice. And I want you to ask for a physical therapy referral. And if those things feel unsafe to you, then no, of course you don't do them. And if you want to wait for randomized double-blind controlled trials, that can never happen with a diet and lifestyle study because patients will know what they are doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So have, well, and I think, I think your comment at the beginning too mm -hmm. about risk, right? You're taking on relatively low risk interventions. You know, it's, it's, it's almost like, well, what's the downside? If this can only potentially help, why not give it a try? And, and you know, I think they were so afraid that I was telling people to not take drugs. I'm like, well, no, I'm saying take drugs according to what is clinically indicated, what you and your neurologist decide is appropriate and what your own personal risk tolerance is. Mm -hmm. Everyone should be addressing diet stress reduction and exercise. <laughs> and, and, you know, finally, I, I think people are, are are hearing that that is has been my, my consistent message is you may be able to, some people get great results and can, and can transition from their highly effective, somewhat, you know, uh, serious adverse effects drugs to moderately effective, lower side effect drugs to uh, drugs with um, that are uh, lower effectiveness, minimal side effects to no drugs whatsoever. Uh, in, in, in my clinical practice and in our clinical trials, we'll tell people, stay on your drugs, stay on your drugs, stay on your drugs. Uh, and we would work very hard to try and get them to stay on their drugs. And they're feeling so great. And this with a wide variety of autoimmune conditions. So we're talking not just MS, inflammatory bowel disease, mm -hmm. RA, uh, Bichette's, sarcoid. Mm -hmm. They they um, take themselves off their drugs uh, and go uh, work with primary care. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then I, I now stress to individuals, if you go off your drugs, you need to know that diet and lifestyle are your disease modifying treatment. Mm -hmm. If you then have a cheat meal, mm -hmm. expect a severe rebound. Mm -hmm. And your specialist will say, see, I told you diet and lifestyle don't work. And what I want you to hear me in your ear saying, see, I told you cheating or abandoning your diet and lifestyle doesn't work. You'll have a severe rebound. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you know that it's not in your nature to never cheat, then you can't be stopping your drugs. Yeah, good to, to know yourself and your body will, like you said, will, will sound the alarm. Um, what does, I know that right now you're doing an, a current study, a longer study, five years. Yes. I no, think I it's see a two-year study. Oh. Two-year intervention, but we have five okay. years of funding. Got it. Got it. Five years of the funding. So two-year study, efficacy of diet and quality of life in multiple sclerosis. Can you talk a little bit about what the goal is with that study? And then if someone wants to be involved in a participant, sure. how they would get involved? So it's for people with relapsing, remitting, multiple sclerosis, age 18 to 70. Uh, and uh, we're going to measure the impact uh, of either a ketogenic diet, a modified paleo diet, or usual diet. In the usual diet uh, group, uh, we give a monthly sort of tips on how to reduce your added sugar, processed foods, eat more vegetables. The two intervention arms uh, meet with the dietitian to learn more about the uh, intervention diets, either the ketogenic diet or the modified uh, paleo diet. Mm -hmm. People come in at baseline, we get a baseline MRI that looks at brain volume, uh, enhancing lesions. You do not get gadolinium. So we have a more powerful research magnet so you can tell if you have enhancing lesions without the gadolinium. We get measures of walking, hand function, vision function, uh, and, we uh, and um, working memory. And we have uh, patient-reported outcomes on fatigue and quality of life. The primary outcome is quality of life. The secondary outcomes are um, brain structure and particularly interested in um, brain volume loss. Because if you have MS, this is accelerated aging of the brain. Brain volume loss uh, occurs three times as fast in the MS patient as compared to the healthy, contr uh, healthy controls. So one of my hypotheses is that if you improve your diet, we can get you back to healthy rates of aging. Mm. That that will be huge. Even if we get close, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. will be huge. That will be big. Uh, and I, I'm very hopeful that we can reduce the number of enhancing lesions. Uh, that's going to be hard, harder to measure because the drugs are so effective at treating mm -hmm. off enhancing lesions. I'm not sure we'll be able to see that. But we, But those drugs aren't very good at slowing brain volume loss. I'm very hopeful that diet will slow brain volume loss. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, we'll be looking at uh, diet's effect on uh, walking function, hand function, uh, vision function, uh, and working memory. Uh, and we'll also we'll be measuring uh, effect on anxiety and depression. And for MS, anxiety and depression are very, very common. Um, uh, many, many people, the vast majority have fatigue, the vast majority have some level of anxiety uh, and depression. And um, there's more uh, awareness that uh, working memory is impaired uh, and uh, we're at a much greater risk for cognitive decline. This will be the largest, longest study um, that's been done in the setting of MS. Um, so we are very, very excited about that. I want everyone to know that it's quite possible because we know that people who volunteer to be in dietary intervention studies do that because they want to improve their diet. So always, always the usual care group improves their diet. They're not eating the standard American diet. They're, they have a, a much better diet. So the, and the fact that we're going to give the usual care group some uh, tips and resources to improve their diet. I think it's quite possible that we'll have the ketogenic group improve, we'll have the uh, paleo diet improve. And because 
based on other dietary intervention studies, we anticipate that the usual care group will, is also going to improve their diet as well. Uh, and so it's, it's quite possible that all three groups will improve and that we may not be able to show a difference between this, uh, all three. Mm -hmm. But uh, because many of these uh, drug studies uh, have included MRIs in these same measures, we'll be able mm -hmm. to use the placebo arms of these studies that are happening at the same time uh, as a, another uh, comparison group as well. That's great. That's great. And how, if someone wanted to participate in the study, where would they go to get involved? So uh, the, the um, oh, and I'll make sure you have this in your show notes. So the easiest thing to do is to go to terrywalls.com. You'll mm -hmm. see the banner for the slide for the study across the top. And you can click uh, the links there to screen for the study. You can also go to, if you Google Walls Lab uh, at U Iowa. That will bring you to our uh, research. So, um, uh, and I'll get you that link. Our, our email address, so we can send you the links, uh, is msdietstudy at healthcare.uiowa.edu. Uh, Perfect. We'll definitely link those in the show notes. And as we're wrapping up, I feel like there's so many more questions I would love to, to ask you and love to just hear more about sort of your, what you've discovered as your daily routine and self-care practices that are the essentials for you. Um, I usually close with three questions. And the first one is, what are the three things that you do on a regular basis that have the biggest positive impact on your health? So, you know, maybe three practices that you've found to have the biggest impact as you've gone down this journey yourself. Um, going outside early in the morning, Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, getting some some sunlight, uh, uh, looking uh, at the sky, uh, getting that that bright sunlight uh, into my face, uh, walking outside uh, or jogging. I'm, I'm pleased to say now jogging outside. <laughs> it's uh, amazing. Uh, uh, meditation. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that I like, um, I like doing um, saunas uh, and cold showers, uh, ice baths. Mm. And do you do them usually alternating like a contrast or do you do them just separately one at a time? Well, yeah, it, um, so it's, it depends how it fits into my schedule. Um, mm -hmm. So I like doing a sauna and then uh, following that with a cold shower. Um, sometimes I don't have enough time uh, and I'll just do uh, a, a sauna uh, in the evening uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, my cold shower. Uh, but I uh, really like doing that in the morning. I love that. What's, is there one thing that you think would have a big impact on your health, but you have a hard time implementing it or something that you tend to, to not be able to incorporate as much? Well, I, I like exercise uh, a whole lot. And so one of the things that I struggle with is uh, doing enough uh, uh, meditation. So mm -hmm. I, the amount of time I spend meditating tends to wax and wane. Mm -hmm. I, and so... I would rather be exercising than meditating as uh, so I have to keep reminding myself that, no, no, I, I sleep better if I uh, meditate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And some exercise can be a form of meditation too, but always, always difficult to, to play that game of what's most important as you're thinking about, you know, sleep, exercise, meditation, when you only have a little bit of time. Now, the other thing that, that I have discovered is uh, it, it, it was great when I retired from the VA. I had more time to do this um, so I could indulge in taking an hour and a half uh, for my self-care. And some days I'll do two hours of self-care uh, in the morning uh, mm -hmm. and very occasionally I get two and a half hours in. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I don't do that, my face pain is more likely to turn on. So over time I've realized, yeah, I don't feel like doing that. But if I don't, I am more likely to have my face pain turn on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nothing like that as a as a feedback mechanism. All right, last question is: What does a healthy life look like to you, Doctor Walls? Um, you want to be connected to family and friends. Uh, if you are lonely, that is so inflammatory. Um, I also want to have a clear purpose and mission in life. Um, uh, I find that exhilarating uh, and joyful. Uh, and um, then I, I want to eat. Play of these non-starchy vegetables, exercise, get outside, um, 
I love being in my garden. Uh, I love uh, picking berries, uh, planting uh, new berry bushes, uh, new trees for our orchard. I love that. That's beautiful. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me and for sharing your story. I think it's incredibly inspiring and for those of you who haven't yet you know go check out some of the some of the videos just watching the the dramatic transformation from you know back when you were in a wheelchair now you're running in the morning and being able to not only experience that yourself but the way that you're sharing it with other people and dedicating so much of your time and energy to doing the research and getting the data um, to really understand this better and, and use it to help so many more people not only for ms but as a as a model that translates to so many other you know, symptoms, disease states of just how important, you know, our nutrition, our lifestyle is on our health. So thank you so much for all the work you do and for taking the time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you enjoy listening to the podcast, please consider subscribing and giving it a five-star rating on iTunes. It really does help to get the word out to more people.